What's up, everybody? I'm Sam, and I'm super excited today to have this conversation. I've got Grant Gelt here from Mass Colt. He's a founding partner of this creative agency based out of Nashville. We've done a lot of really cool stuff with Grant over the past few years. Uh, most specifically, we worked on a live stream. So I'm excited to kind of get into the conversation and share some tidbits that we've learned. But Grant, do you want to just maybe introduce yourself a couple lines? Sure. Uh, yeah, like Sam, it's great to be here with you. But again, my name is Grant Gelt. I'm a co-founding partner and CEO of Mascult, a uh, full-service creative agency based here in Nashville. So we do everything from the creative agency spectrum, design, branding, web, experiential, interactive, uh, all the way through. Love it. Yeah. And I know that you and I just kind of recently got introduced, but you've been working with Single for a number of years and Single's an app on top of Shopify. Like, how did you make your way to Shopify? What was that like initially like? And what is the landscape? Oh, it's funny, you know, the, like the Nashville now? community is getting bigger every day and smaller by the minute. So uh, <laughs> Tommy and I were neighbors in oh, no East Nashville. We work uh, back when it was literally Tommy as a single person and no uh, one room office here. And, and Love I, I was working a lot in the music space. So everything that he was building uh, initially was single from just from the chart reporting side was so groundbreaking. Um, and it was something that I, as a former artist manager, really wished uh, I had had. So Tommy and I struck it off and uh, got to know each other really well. And I've been a big fan and follower of what single has been building ever since. Cool. Yeah. And I think you pointed to something uh, is like a lot of people end up coming to single first for like the reporting and the selling music side. And then you open up like this can of worms and there's a lot more to it. Um, how do you, what do you think about that? Like, I'd love to hear about like how your Shopify stores have kind of changed over the past few years. And when you think about Shopify, you think about merch and it maybe drops off there, but like just a couple months ago, we just did a really awesome stream with one of the bands that you work with. And it's not what you think of when you think of Shopify. So like, yeah. Any, any comments on that? Sam? No, that's a great question. And it, you know, that's one of the terrific things about the tool is that it really is a direct consumer vehicle yeah. right in the beginning this problem that needed to be solved of course was chart reporting but at the end of the day maintaining that direct consumer relationship as so many distractions and other places start competing for that attention yeah. uh single is an amazing job of expanding shopify from what you think of just being a e-commerce platform to really being a kind of one-stop solution for engaging with your fans and being able to capture the commerce relationship at the same time. Totally. Yeah. And I, I often find when I'm working with new artists or artist teams in this space, it's like, we could say those things. And sometimes like you really need to contextualize that. Like most recently we worked on an empty void stream. And mm -hmm. maybe if you want to talk a bit more about that and what that's translated into. Absolutely. And that was a perfect use case for, you know, this, this single platform. And I've been looking for a project to do um, on the stack for uh, quite some time. So in working with Empty Void, uh, which for people who don't know, Empty Void is a side project from Justin Chancellor, the bass player of Tool, uh, and Peter Mohammed, um, who's out of Poland. And it's a really beautiful, abstract art project that's wrapped up in this musical soundscape. So it was really a terrific opportunity as we were setting up this self-released record of theirs to break down that wall between Justin and Peter and this audience who may know them independently, but not collectively, and really have a real conversation. So in thinking about the best possible platform to do that, what better uh, than the artist's storefront. It's first party, we yeah. have complete control over it. And it's really a terrific opportunity to have that conversation with people and be able to, you know, contextually put the limited edition record uh, in front of people at the same time without pounding on them to, totally. to purchase. Yeah. yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, I have a couple of just like questions that came to mind, as you said that, like, okay. When you're working with bands, like where does that education usually fall? Do they come to you with these ideas or do you also find that um, like where are they kind of in this space and catching up of like there's all these algorithms that like demand their time and their attention and their fans are on there. But they also are trying to balance yeah, a, that's, that's a good with question. the fact I, that they also I lost have you for a website second, and Sam, a web store where they're maybe question. collecting more important data that like helps them continually re-engage. Um, so how did that even come about with the band and, and how did it eventually shape up as a stream? Uh, it's a great question. So, you know, this, this initial conversation started with uh, Justin's management. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. We were having a conversation about the record. Um, It's really important to both Justin and Peter to have a direct relationship with their fans. I mean, their other projects, as you know, uh, are pretty specific in the way that they engage and have those uh, relationships. So for the Empty Void Gang, being able to break down that wall, like I said earlier, and have a real conversation. So in talking out the plan and the strategy with management, it really presented itself as like, hey, this is really the right yeah. way to go and to address the record. You know, because what we wanted to avoid was just telling people, hey, there's this thing, out, go buy it and do yeah. this, figure it out on your own. We wanted to be able to answer questions that people had, answer questions that people didn't have, explain what was really behind this. So again, in thinking about the best vehicle for it, we were like, hey, this is this is the way that we want to get this record in front of people. It's better than, you know, chopping stuff up and just putting yeah. it, putting it out there. Let people be part of a conversation and really get that dynamic between the two creators there. Because when you can see that relationship that they have and the way that they talk about the music and everything yeah, yeah. like that, it opens the doors to a whole new way uh, for a new audience member. And that was the thing that we really tried to solve for here. You know tools. You know Peter's projects, but you don't necessarily know Empty Void, yeah. and you should have a conversation around that. I like what you said, actually, around there being like a new fan. And I often think this space that you're solving for kind of in your own words is is that. Like, you, fans show up in all their ways, and there's like traditional ways that fans show up. And especially with technology today, the idea of fandom is always evolving, right? Um, but I think like at the same time with like streaming culture and the, like the new landscape, there's like, there's this ever importance to also cater to every fan on every platform in every way. And often as a result of that, it's really easy to think about all the things and maybe not think about some things. And I, I guess the point that I'm trying to drive home is like, by offering a free live stream in your storefront, you created a space for the band to get what they wanted which is like knowing their fans and giving that super fan that opportunity and as a response it created a direct connection for future engagement that really ultimately is truly one-to-one between the band and the fan um yeah oh, i i agree with that completely and you know i speaking for myself and i, I would <laughs> assume you would agree you know we're here even just together today because we started as fans of something we fans yeah. of music fans of art fans of culture Right. And I've always believed that every fan deep down wants to know and think that the artist, the person that they're a fan of is aware (laughs) that that they exist and want to have that one to one relationship. So what better than the one place that the artist really controls their site and their storefront to be able to give back to that? Right. When you're an artist or a brand, it, it. the general philosophy is sell, right? You got to mm-hmm. make the record. You got to pay for the tour. You got to pay for all of this stuff. But art is a service, right? So to be able to let your fans know, hey, jump off of these platforms where we are all the product and come yeah. to our home, we'll let you in. Let's have a conversation. Let's put the content out through here. You can take advantage of all these places where everybody lives for those five minutes every day. But if you don't leverage the one place that you really can have complete control over, to me, I think that's a missed opportunity. Totally. Man, you said that so perfectly that like we're all products on these platforms. And yes, yes. They're not charging us for it, right? Which means if it's free to us to use, then somebody's got to be making some some money somewhere else. And as an artist, that's not the right philosophy in my mind. To have. Sure, we all want to put our music in people's hands and our tickets in people's hands, but you still have to be able to connect with them authentically. And that's mm-hmm. what we really try to do every day at Mass Cult. And that's one of the reasons why we keep going back to the single platform because it's really what it's built for. Yeah, no, definitely. That being said, like Shopify, I mean, in, in, maybe in another world, Direct Fan can completely, you know, override the reach of third party platforms. You know, of course, like, if you are an insanely popular artist, you're going to have to be on these platforms just out of, you know, that that's the cultural norm. That being said, they don't replace each other and they come alongside each other. But 
because we're so used to thinking about social media as just like normal distribution channels of reach, like that, that direct to fan side is often an afterthought. And maybe after having done some of these things, I'm curious to know, like, how do you advise your clients on like balancing those two worlds? Like if they come to you with like a content idea or like a new product idea, or they just have a new moment, like how would you recommend for people just starting out to maybe start thinking about this space to start building? It doesn't have to be perfect, but just kind of get those wheels going. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in using the best tool for the jobs, mm -hmm. right? So with socials, yeah, you have to be on them, but how you are on them is reflective of, I guess, kind of what really makes sense. And I know that's a bit of an abstract answer, but you've got to use them for what you're geared for, which is discovery when the algorithms put the discovery right in, in front of you. So we always recommend using everything the way that they're built. Mm -hmm. And to try to take the best advantage of them, Op learn how to use them, operationalize them, use them as the best that you can. But at the end of the day, we're still just firm believers in you push everybody back to your site. I don't know, maybe it's my, <laughs> my generation, but when I'm looking <laughs> for news on something, I'm going to go to the website. And if it's not updated, then I'm going to go to socials yeah. because I know not everything is going to reach me when it's supposed to. So, you know, we put a lot of faith and stock into the importance of the site and the store, because as platforms expand, as they go away, as they change or get bought or get sold, your domain, your store, your one-to-one -one is yours. So we try to really create, you know, this sort of feedback loop where everything ultimately everything puts you back into it. So whether you get the news from the newsletter or it pops up or there's a, you see the Facebook post or somebody shares an Instagram post with you, if all roads lead back to yeah. the artist over time, that's really where you're going to start to get your most dedicated and start to, you know, condition other people to go, Hey, go, go back to my site. Yeah. First. And I think you seeped that into the um, live stream that you did with Empty Void. And the last time, if I recall correctly, wasn't it like a 72-hour playback of just trying to re-engage folks? Exactly. Uh, you know, with Justin being stateside and he was on the road with, with Tool during, during that time and Peter being overseas, we wanted to make sure that everybody, wherever they were and going into a weekend, access to see it. So while we put it up, uh, a sort of a live stream with the chat and had some great conversations in there with people. Uh, we wanted to make sure everybody had the opportunity to do it. And it was a free stream as well. We weren't charging tickets for it. So there was mm -hmm. nothing really to prevent us from keeping it up um, and letting everybody get their chance to see it. Totally. Yeah. No, I love that. Kind of reflecting on that. And obviously it's just the start of 2024 here. Uh, weird to say, but uh, like, what are some things that you maybe gained over this past year having done some of this work? And obviously sometimes I think something I keep maybe honing in on is like, once you get started, that relationship and that platform continues to make sense. Maybe what are some things that like having done that already enables you to continue to do with these fans moving forward? Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to continuing to be authentic and mm -hmm. doing what feels right to the artist and helping you get what's in their minds out in in the right way, but also maintaining the right expectations with yeah. the fans as well. There's no point in pushing somebody into doing something if they're not mm -hmm. fully into it. Um, so that's all we really try to continue to work with, uh, with our artists on is coming up with authentic experiences yeah. exactly. that ultimately will help move the needle um, on the ultimate goals that we're trying to do. But the biggest goal that we want to do is make sure that our artists and the brands that we work with have a real relationship with their fans. So that either means a regular stream of content or doing the right pieces at the yeah. right time, um, quality over quantity. Uh, so it, as long as it's real and it's coming from a service-based place, uh, we think that's going to continue to keep the, those profiles up. Yeah, I love that. And I think that's so true because, you know, when you come to a place like Shopify, they have a whole ecosystem of things that you could do. And obviously single fits into that. You know, we've got live stream tools, we've got membership tools. Mm -hmm. um, and you could think about it and say like, 
do I just follow other people? And I think people pave a way for a, uh, a blueprint and a model to kind of be inspired by, but fans know more than anything what is authentic. And taking and reinterpreting those tools and those platforms to show up as yourself and like be honest, like, hey, I'm here because. I'm looking to do this with my fans and I want to give back in this way. And this is what this enables. Like, I think that's all part of the conversation and fans are also aware of that today that like that they've been siloed from artists in, in ways like, you know, you could be on Spotify and not know who your top fan is like in vice versa. You might not, not know that you're the number one listener. And um, I, every artist that I talk to an artist team is like, I wish I could give them something. So I think having, tools that you could reinterpret so you could do what feels right. Maybe the reward is like a DM, maybe it's a merch shirt or just like, Hey, I appreciate you. Like that goes so far in this game. Exactly. It doesn't have to be anything other than organic. Yeah. Right. So if, if you say, Hey, I want to go ahead and give my top 50 people a free shirt. Great. It's the fact that you're thinking of them. And that they, yeah. so <laughs> to be able to have these tools and you talked about it earlier, you know, this sort of, entryway into what single does what i love about the platform is the way that it contextualizes data as well and makes it really easy to see what is happening inside of that direct to fan relationship and the more tools that you use with it yeah. uh the broader that picture is so that you can start the paint of of who your fans are and from my perspective it's not to monetize them it's to identify yeah. them because fans are smart. They can tell when they're being sold to. They can tell when something's funky behind the scenes, especially the really passionate ones. And no, you can't please every fan. And the unhappy ones are typically the loudest all the time. But if you take an approach where it's about getting to know who they are and being appreciative of what they do, that gets into the DNA of the fan and the fan base totally. and, yeah. and they come back and they grow and they expand. So, you know, building a fan base isn't a sprint, right? It, it takes time. You look at some of the artists who are out there who are the biggest artists in the world right now. And they've been around for 30 years because yeah. they're taking the time and they're doing it right. And yeah, the industry has changed, but we're all adapting with it. But it, oh, it goes back to that level of authenticity. And if your right. fan knows that you're paying attention. Yeah. Even in the smallest ways, it, it, it matters. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that's an awesome point to end on. We talk a lot about technology and sometimes identifying fans who get mixed up with maybe even monetizing them. But like at the heart of it, like that authentic um, action that like that can come from like just knowing your fans is like the end goal. And of course, artists have to make a living and their teams and all those things. But I think doing it, right in a way that's set up for you and and your fans is like, like so key you, you nailed that home earlier you said doing it on the right place so yeah it, it it's like anything it starts from the top right yeah. and when it ultimately makes its way down to the agency the creative team like you me yeah. it's coming from somewhere it's coming from a conversation between the artist and management or the management and the label and we then get to be that really nice filter and funnel at the end that goes, okay, cool. So what is it that we really want to yeah. do here? <laughs> and how can we go ahead and do it in the way that is best for the fan? Um, and that's where, you know, the tools um, are, are the most critical. Cool. Yeah. I love that. Well, Grant, if you have any like last words, I think we could probably wrap it up there and like maybe let people cool. know where they could find you if that's helpful and, and just get yeah. in touch. Absolutely. Keep building. What are, you guys are building amazing, <laughs> amazing stuff. So keep building. I'm excited to see what, what this year has in store for you. Uh, and if anybody wants to get in touch with us, it's masscult.co and on Instagram, masscult underscore co. Uh, we're here in Nashville. Awesome. Love it. Cool. Grant, thank you for your time. Love this chat. I feel like we're going to have to keep this one going. <laughs> Let's keep it going. Anytime. Anytime. Yeah. Cool. Love cool. it. Thanks, Sam. See you guys. Appreciate it.